At any moment, lightning will strike the Earth a thousand times a second, and countless storms will tear through the atmosphere. Yet these phenomena are but fleeting glimpses of a far more powerful force. Today, a global search is underway to unravel the mysteries of Earth's climate. Over time, the climate of the Earth changes as dramatically as the seasons. But only now are scientists beginning to find out how and why. This is the story of their search. It begins with the fragments of a giant puzzle collected from around the world. An incredible saga is beginning to unfold of droughts and searing cold of warm spells and eons of ice. The pieces are everywhere, in the corals of a Caribbean paradise, and beneath the sands of India in the pollen of simple plants. They can be found in a limestone cave in New Zealand and in the high reaches of the Swiss Alps. There are pieces of the puzzle in stones of an Antarctic desert and in the shells of microscopic creatures found at the bottom of the sea. Even in these skyscrapers of clay on Africa's plains, tiny creatures that far outnumber humankind are helping to change the air we breathe today. In a citadel of climate research in Colorado, scientists have created an electronic crystal ball with it, they can plot Earth's ancient climate and peer into the future well beyond our lifetime. The picture now emerging is one of dramatic climate change that will affect all of us on planet Earth. Join us now on an intriguing journey across time and continents as scientists piece together the puzzle of Earth's changing climate. Land of great ice lies the strangest desert in the world. 200 mile an hour winds and temperatures 100 degrees below zero make the dry valleys of Antarctica one of the most inhospitable places on earth. Here an unusual tale of climate and life is unfolding. Not even the sophisticated devices we have sent to explore other planets could have found what scientists have found here. Each Antarctic summer since 1976, researchers have come here to study a primitive form of life found nowhere else on Earth. The climate of Antarctica is so hostile, it has driven life to take refuge inside among the pores of ancient rock. Rick, I'm gonna chop off a piece of this rock and show you For a scant five days each year, the sun warms the rock enough for tiny organisms to break their slumber of frozen quiet. From the rock itself, they take nourishment, and from the air, bits of scarce moisture. Quickly, they reproduce, then become dormant, until next year's summer sun wakes them once again. A mere tenth of an inch below the surface, the microbes are safe from the vicious climate. Each dark band is a miniature ecosystem. Long strands of fungi and clusters of algae join to form the lichen that grows among the rock crystals. The microbes actually change their shape to fit this unusual habitat. To learn how life can exist here in this extreme environment, the scientists provide nutrients to the organisms. Organisms grow so slowly is that they may be deficient in some of these essential nutrients. So over a number of years, we may see a stimulation in their growth. In another experiment, the scientists create artificial greenhouses to lengthen the microbes' growing season. They want to know how life will change as climate changes. And if we leave these guys out for uh, three or four years, the heat created by the greenhouse effect should warm up the rock so that hopefully the organisms will have a better chance of growing.
Here, in the most barren environment on Earth, life fits inside nearly every loose rock. It now seems clear that life on Earth is dramatically shaped by Earth's climate. Through eons of evolution, the great array of life on Earth has developed strategies to cope with the changing climate. Driven by some mysterious internal time clock, some birds travel thousands of miles each year to escape the onset of winter. Animals that cannot flee meet the challenge of a climate turned extreme in numerous and ingenious ways. They adapt by foraging or hibernation. The great chain of life reflects the continuing drama of Earth's changing climate. The fate of human endeavor may also be linked to our inconstant Earth. An unusually benign climate coincided with the rise of civilization, perhaps even fostered its development. Indeed, civilizations first flourished in regions that are truly harsh today, in the searing sands of the ancient Middle East. The inescapable effects of climate change also may have been an important factor in human upheavals throughout history. South of the Himalayas, where India meets Pakistan, lies the great Rajasthan Desert, the most populated arid region on Earth. For thousands of years, people have scratched a living from this bleak world. On sparse desert grasses, they raise domesticated animals and carefully guard what little water can be found. Here, water is more precious than gold. It comes but once a year. For weeks at a time, the monsoon lashes India with steady sheets of rain. Usually, summers are wet and winters are dry, but the monsoon reverses the pattern. The monsoon has fueled the Indian breadbasket for millennia. Deep in the Rajasthan desert, these temples at Osian bear mute testimony to the spiritual values of an ancient and prosperous civilization. They are symbols of the many cultures that have disappeared, caught in the vagaries of time and climate. As archaeologists recover the ruins from the sands, so too have scientists discovered an archaeology of climate. The ancient city of Lothal, once the seaport of the Harappan culture, now landlocked by the desert sands. For a thousand years, the Harappans prospered here as farmers and distributors of grain. Then, mysteriously, they disappeared. Climate historian Reed Bryson of the University of Wisconsin is an expert on the monsoons his advice is critical to the region's farmers. We'll have above normal precipitation. Bryson has also wondered about the disappearance of the Harappans. Many archaeologists believe they had been weakened by a succession of invasions. Bryson's curiosity led him to Sambar Salt Lake, where he found another answer. Stratified lake sediments like this are like a book in which the history of the climate of this region has been written because in those layers, each year in its history over the last 10,000 years, plant pollen, sand, various things have blown in and accumulated. And we now know how to look at that assemblage of various kinds of plant pollen and charcoal and sand and interpret it to read the writing of history in this Lake sediment. The layers of pollen have revealed a prolonged drought, a time when the monsoons failed and the Harappan culture collapsed. 
a quarter of a million people may have perished in the desert. Today, hundreds of millions depend on the return of the monsoons. The study of ancient civilizations reveals that the past can leave long shadows that affect the present and the future. The records left in the Rajasthan cover but an instant in the history of Earth's climate. In a limestone cave in northern New Zealand, the slow drip of water has created a much longer record. Here, scientists have become explorers. With headlamps and protective gear, they seek to push the climate record back further in geologic time. Geochemists Chris and Vivian Hendy. This is the spot here. This is where we set up the plastic tubing to collect the water for the radiocarbon dating. And the next problem was we had to find a stalagmite or stalactite which would give us a suitably long time record for oxygen isotope analysis. Now if you took these straws, they grow two or three metres and then they drop off. It's better if we go to stalagmites. Now here we have a very large one underneath us. This is Mount Egmont. As water and minerals seep through the ground above, they create the delicate architecture of the cave. Some minerals deposited when the climate was cold differ from those deposited when it was warm. The minerals actually create a chemistry that can be extracted as an historical record of the world's climate. Drip by drip, the cave forms before our eyes. Formations like these have been created over tens of thousands of years and with them a perfect record of change in temperature and moisture of the past. Concerned about preserving the fragile beauty of the cave, Hendy and his party have hiked a mile through ankle-deep water to look for a specimen that can be removed for analysis. Right, now there's the one that we finally took. It's out of the way. It was a stalactite that was already broken. It eventually went down to about here. It was probably part of a column that was joined to the floor, but the floor dropped away and left this broken stub. So we had a full 100,000 years record from one side through to the other. Andy collects water from these ancient stalactites. The mineral content helps him determine the age of the formations. Chemistry and composition has been changing. At Waikato University, Hendy dates and analyzes the limestone layer by layer. His research would confirm a history chronicled by the artists of another time and place. As Dutch artists created their famous landscapes, little did they know they were documenting a dramatic shift in Earth's climate. Today, the Dutch canals rarely freeze, but in the 17th century, more than three centuries of unusually severe winters plunged Europe into what scientists now call the Little Ice Age. A hundred years ago, the idea of an ice age was inconceivable. A few intrepid scientists had suggested such a possibility, but they were largely ignored. In the middle of the 19th century, a picture began to emerge of a time when Earth's climate was dramatically different. A time when ice ruled the world. For hundreds of years, these towering walls and precariously perched boulders mystified all who saw them. Most thought they were swept here by the great flood so vividly described in the Bible. But in 1837, another persistent observer had a different idea. It was here in the Swiss resort town of Neuchâtel that the ideas of a young scientist would ignite one of the most violent disputes in the history of science. Swiss naturalist Louis Agassiz shocked the scientific establishment when he declared that the world around them was once covered by ice more than a mile thick. To support his theory, Agassiz pointed to the strange boulders. He matched their geology to mountains hundreds of miles away. The rocks were simply too large to have been moved by flood water. 
Nearby, in huge sheets of rock, he found grooves and channels. Elsewhere, he observed bedrock that was amazingly flat, as if sheared by a giant knife. In his notebooks, Agassiz vividly illustrated a distant epoch of extreme cold when ice covered much of the earth. He called it an ice site or ice age. What was a radical idea for science was obvious to those who lived and worked here. The chamois hunters of the high Alps had long identified the strange rocks as pieces of distant mountains that had broken away and were moved across the land by the glaciers. The lost rocks, like lost sheep, were called foundlings. Agassiz had heard these tales. From these simple and elegant intuitions, he would define his scientific theories. To convince others, Agassiz organized many field trips to the glaciers, a tradition still observed by scientists. These glacier walls are as dramatic today as they were then. To Agassiz, they were God's great plow slowly but steadily carved and shaped the valleys below. Still more startling, Agassiz argued that glaciers were the remnants of a time when ice not only covered Switzerland, but stretched from the North Pole to the Mediterranean Sea. Each summer, scientists return to explore the glaciers of the High Alps. They hike among the rock and along ridges that so intrigued Louis Agassiz. A glacier is virtually a river of ice. With an imperceptible motion, it scours everything in its path. Like a river, it flows at varying speeds to create treacherous currents called crevasses. Hundreds of feet deep, they can disappear almost overnight, collapsed by the continuous onslaught of the ice. Nearly one half of the Earth's landscape has been carved by such unceasing force. Eventually, we would come to know that not one, but numerous vast and regular ice ages have dominated the planet. For most of the last million years, ice was the normal climate of Earth. An ice age begins when summer temperatures fail to melt the snow from a previous winter. Year after year, the ice sheet grows. Only the tropical climate near the equator can stop its advance. Eventually, the Earth mysteriously warms up and the ice begins to retreat. But what sets an ice age in motion? No earthbound theory can explain the causes of such dramatic shifts in climate. Intrigued by this mystery, Yugoslavian mathematician Milutin Milankovic sought to develop an astronomical theory that would account for the ice ages. He believed they were caused by changes in the Earth's relationship to the sun. We have long known that the seasons are caused by the tilt of the Earth on its axis. But every 41,000 years, the Earth's tilt varies by a few degrees. Every 100,000 years, Earth's orbit varies from nearly circular to elliptical, moving the Earth millions of miles further from the Sun. and Earth wobbles slowly like a top in space to complete a circle about every 20,000 years. The tilt, stretch, and wobble of Earth's orbit changed the distribution of energy received from the Sun. It was Milankovitch who calculated that these changes could trigger the ice ages. Without evidence to support it, his theory was forgotten until a serendipitous discovery in the Caribbean island of Barbados. At first, scientists were puzzled by the island's terraces that looked like giant stair steps. Eventually, they determined the terraces were actually ancient beaches because the terraces contained fossils of coral like those still found along the shore of Barbados today. Since coral grows only in shallow water, 
the terraces suggest that sea level was once higher here. Could the terraces reflect a time between the ice ages when sea level rose as the land ice melted? When the fossil beaches were dated, they appeared to match the astronomical cycles suggested by Milankovitch, a clue that his theory was right, adding one more piece to the climate puzzle. After World War II, scientists embarked on a global search for the remains of past climates on the ocean floor. A device called a piston corer is plunged through thousands of feet of ocean and into the muds along the bottom. The explorers would discover that the sediments on the sea floor held a record of the great ice sheets on land. In the laboratory, sea cores are unwrapped, time capsules from an ancient earth. When the core is dissected, nearly a half million years of Earth's climate history is revealed. At the Lamont Doherty Geological Observatory at Columbia University, thousands of cores from around the world are catalogued and stored. They create an unrivaled library of the past. Geologist James Hayes has pioneered in the analysis of sea cores. Interpretation of these ancient records is a milestone in climate science. Although the fact that ice ages had once occurred was first realized from studying the geology of continental surfaces, continents do not contain a very good record of the sequence of advances and retreats of the great ice sheets. This is simply because the continent surfaces are always being worn away, either by the abrasion of the great ice sheets themselves or by the action of rain, rivers, and wind. Now, all the particles that are washed from the continents eventually end up in the ocean, forming muds on the ocean floor, such as this core. These cores, in contrast to the fragmented record of the continents, contain a complete record of long periods of time. The cores also contain the fossil remains of tiny organisms that thrived in the ancient seas. When they died, their shells rained down to become the sediments on the ocean bottom. Layer upon layer, these shells form a vast record of changing climate. The fossils of ancient marine life are carefully extracted from the cores. As these tiny glass-like shells are sorted and organized, they begin to tell a story. These are the shells of microscopic organisms known as radiolaria. When living, these creatures are delicately adapted to the temperature and chemistry of the water in which they live. As climate changes and the temperature of the ocean water changes, different species are favored and flourish. The distribution of radiolaria is linked to changes in the temperature of seawater. By charting temperature changes, Hayes and his colleagues found a cycle that matched the one suggested by Milankovitch. Therefore, each ocean core can be viewed as a monitoring station which carefully records changes in the ocean water that lies above it. With many cores from all over the world, we can reconstruct global changes in the ocean that accompany ice age cycles. By mapping the global temperature of ancient seas and connecting them with cycles in space, researchers have moved one step closer to a solution of the ice age puzzle. An ingenious method of analysis would reveal still another matching cycle. In addition to temperature, the chemistry of the ocean also changes during an ice age. The shells of marine organisms record this change. By comparing them through isotope analysis, Hayes can determine when the ice ages occurred.
When the cycles of change in temperature and chemistry were plotted, it was discovered that both cycles matched those predicted by Milankovitch. Changes in the geometry of Earth's orbit are the pacemakers of the ice ages. New York's Hudson River is a striking example of the recurring phenomenon. James Hayes. 15 to 17,000 years ago, this valley was filled with a river of ice instead of the Hudson River. At that time, the ice in this valley drained the great North American ice sheet, which was rapidly retreating to the north. The question we must ask now is, will the ice one day return to this valley? The answer to that question is yes. For just as the change of the seasons are controlled by the geometry of the Earth's orbit around the sun, so also are ice ages. As fall will certainly change to winter, just as inevitably the ice will return to this valley. If Hayes and his colleagues are right, planet Earth may face another ice age, which could reach its peak some 100,000 years from now. miles from the South Pole is Vostok, one of several research stations manned by the Soviet Union in Antarctica. Vostok, which has recorded the coldest temperature on Earth, sits on the thickest part of the Antarctic ice sheet. The arrival of an American transport is a rare sight. This one has brought French glaciologist Claude Laurius here to share in the celebration of an historic event. May I say three words? Three words. You uh, understand. Ruski, Amerikanski, Franzuski, Vostok, Karasho. <laughs> Thank you. In 1979, the Soviets began an ambitious project. Their goal, to drill through the two and a half mile thick Antarctic ice sheet. The technique of drilling polar ice was first developed here in Greenland. In the ice is a litany of endless seasons as layers of snowfall are compressed over tens of thousands of years. From the ice cores, scientists hope to learn more about the climate that has ruled planet Earth for most of the last million years. The mile-long Vostok core is unique. It contains 150,000 years of Earth's history, from the beginning to the end of the last ice age. Claude Laurius will spend the next three months carefully sectioning and preparing the core for shipment to France. At the Institute of Glaciology in Grenoble, he will begin the long and painstaking analysis. The Vostok core has survived a journey halfway around the world, yet even here it remains extremely fragile. Even the slightest alteration can destroy its unique value as a climate record. To safeguard the core, the laboratory is sterilized and maintained at temperatures below freezing. To eliminate contamination, only the heart of the core is used for analysis. Each layer is like the page of a diary. A mere sliver reveals new detail. Trapped in the ice is dust and ash, a clue to the action of long-dead volcanoes. More intriguing are bubbles of gas, whiffs of ancient air. Seen under polarized light, the ice becomes a kaleidoscope of color and form. Among these tiny crystals is all that is needed to determine the temperatures and chemistry of the atmosphere during the last ice age. One of the most provocative finds is a record of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of the past. Coring has confirmed that the carbon dioxide level during the last ice age was significantly lower than it is today. How it got that way is still unknown. For Claude Laureus, there is a new urgency to the search. If we want to understand current change of our terrestrial environment, 
and eventually be able to predict future conditions. I think it is first very important to establish what were the past changes and see if we are able to understand them and explain them. I think this is a necessity if we want to make projection to the future. Although the advance and retreat of ice seems inevitable, Earth's climate has remained surprisingly temperate over billions of years. Now scientists have uncovered another paradox. It appears our ancient sun was once smaller and radiated less heat than it does today. If the sun was faint, snow would gradually accumulate and the planet grow colder and colder. Eventually the oceans would freeze and Earth would become a glistening planet of ice. But there is no such evidence for this scenario. Liquid water, the basis of life, has existed on Earth for nearly all of its history. A clue to the mystery can be found millions of miles from planet Earth. When the first probes ventured to Venus and Mars, they discovered atmospheres fierce and alien to our own. Venus is hot and noxious. Nearly 900 degrees Fahrenheit at its surface, its rocks glow red. This hothouse climate exists because the thick acid clouds contain an extraordinary amount of carbon dioxide. Like the glass of a greenhouse, carbon dioxide traps heat and prevents it from escaping back into space. The atmosphere of Venus contains some 300,000 times more carbon dioxide than planet Earth. If long ago Venus had liquid water, it boiled away into the atmosphere of this hellish world. At the opposite extreme is Mars, a frozen planet. A land of massive volcanoes, its landscape is testimony to the violent activity that once may have pumped enough carbon dioxide into its atmosphere to warm the planet. The scoured surface of Mars suggests it was once warm enough for liquid water to forge deep canyons and river valleys and to carve great floodplains. But somehow Mars lost its ancient atmosphere, its liquid water disappeared, and what remains is a frozen, decimated world. Venus is a hothouse that cannot cool down. Mars is a world that cannot warm up. Extreme worlds of fire and ice. In orbit between Venus and Mars is Earth. Neither too hot nor too cold. It has an atmosphere with just the right amount of carbon dioxide for life to flourish. Unlike Venus and Mars, the Earth's surface is constantly changing, scoured by wind and water and torn apart by powerful forces within. The carbon stored in the Earth is continually recycled through the land, the oceans, and the atmosphere. Even life plays an important role in the cycle. This dynamic process helps control the amount of carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere and seems to resolve the mystery of our ancient sun. If there was more carbon dioxide in our early atmosphere, it could have trapped enough heat to keep the planet warm. Scientists now believe that abrupt changes in carbon dioxide can cause abrupt shifts in climate, perhaps even influence ice ages. And like Venus and Mars, create radically different worlds. This understanding of the role of carbon dioxide is among the great insights of modern science. Now there is a new urgency to understand the role of carbon dioxide in the life of the planet Earth. 
Since the advent of civilization, and particularly in the industrial age, man has injected enormous amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere by the burning of coal, oil, and gas. The techniques of slash and burn deforestation to create fields for farming releases still more carbon dioxide. A time bomb seems to be ticking in our atmosphere. The climate of Earth is maintained only when the amount of solar energy absorbed by the planet equals the amount returned to space. As carbon dioxide increases, it retards the escape of energy. Like a greenhouse, Earth's lower atmosphere heats up. Hawaii's Mauna Loa Observatory is an ideal laboratory for sampling the Earth's atmosphere. Here in 1958, Charles Keeling of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography developed a method for measuring carbon dioxide. Since then, carbon dioxide has risen some 9%. At this rate, it could double sometime in the next century and raise the mean temperature of Earth some 3 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Such global warming could lead to the most dramatic change in Earth's climate since the last ice age, a change far greater than any experienced by mankind. The predictions of warming are fiercely debated, but all agree we are performing a great experiment on ourselves and our planet. The results of a potential carbon dioxide warming may eventually be seen here. Since the International Geophysical Year in 1958, Antarctica has become a natural laboratory where the dynamics of ice are explored by scientists from around the world. Here, global warming would create a special threat. Most of the Antarctic continent is covered by ice nearly two miles thick. Much of it rests not on land, but in the ocean. It is unstable and susceptible to movement. Scientists are concerned. Could Antarctica lose its ice? They explore even the slightest change in the vast and complex ice cap. Crevasse fields, great frozen rivers that slowly but steadily flow into the Ross Ice Shelf, a floating slab of ice the size of France. The Ross Ice Shelf acts as a plug. It holds back the huge mass of ice that covers West Antarctica. Warming could cause the shelf's leading edge to disintegrate and destroy the barrier that contains the unstable West Antarctic ice sheet behind it. If West Antarctica's ice sheet collapses and melts, sea level could steadily rise some 20 feet to dramatically change the geography of planet Earth. Venice, the crown jewel of the Adriatic. Latticed by canals that form its streets, Venice is often flooded by storms at high tide. If carbon dioxide were to substantially warm the earth, such flooding could become commonplace. Even a small increase in sea level could cause havoc. Storm surges at unusually high tide would threaten coastlines more and more frequently. Eventually, cities would have to respond with dikes and barriers like London has now installed across the Thames to protect it from tidal surges that threaten even now. But populous countries built on coastal plains just above sea level are most vulnerable. In 1970, 300,000 people died during a ravaging storm surge in Bangladesh. A warmer climate could change growing seasons and make temperate regions much drier. The breadbaskets of the world might shift 
the Soviet Union could replace the American Midwest as the world's leading producer of grain. In countries dependent on irrigation, the warming could be devastating. Hotter, drier climates could put still greater pressures on now arid regions. Desert areas would expand. Those who depend on the world's rivers for water may well experience hardship. The Colorado River, which delivers water to America's desert states, already loses more than three quarters of its supply to evaporation. Rising carbon dioxide would also act as a global fertilizer for green plants that thrive on it. Explosive growth could radically alter ecological balances that have evolved over billions of years. We know that climate shapes life. We can only guess at the impact on life from a rapid and major change in global climate. Still, there is a great uncertainty about the consequences of a global warming. Some undoubtedly would benefit, others would suffer. The consequences of a carbon dioxide warming are serious enough to be considered the most important challenge in modern climate research. At the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, meteorologist Warren Washington designs experiments called climate models that simulate the atmosphere of Earth. This is one of the world's fastest computers. It is able to do 100 million operations per second. We're able to do things that we couldn't do 10 years ago on the computer. For example, we're able to generate a computer model of the atmosphere that simulates the winds, the temperatures, the pressures, the rainfall, the snow cover, over 23,000 points over the entire globe. Simulating the dynamics of Earth's atmosphere is a complex task. The land, oceans, polar ice, even life can influence climate. External factors like changes in radiation from the sun can further complicate the model. The enormous speed of the computer manipulates the many climate factors. The simulated Earth is turned on and run for a few computer days to predict weather or for years to predict climate. By changing the factors of the climate model, the scientists in Boulder can perform tests that are not possible in the real world. They explore the scenarios that might reveal the causes of global climate change. Climatologist Steve Schneider uses models to explore the possible impacts of a carbon dioxide warming. The question we have to ask ourselves is, what are models good for? Why do we need them for the future prediction of climate? Well, if we're going to try to figure out what's going to happen in the future, we need to estimate how much greenhouse gas humans are putting in, and then we have to ask what that's going to do to the climate. Well, if you haven't got a physical model, a twin earth, if you will, that we can go and pollute by adding greenhouse gases to and then see what happens, the only other model we can build that has any plausible hope of telling us about the future is a mathematical model which we build and run inside of a computer. We take this model and we describe the present climate in it, essentially simulate the present climate. We then add greenhouse gases that humans are adding to the model, ask the model how has the climate changed, compare the two, and have some idea of what the future might bring us climatically if we did that kind of addition of gases. While some scientists speculate on the future of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, Others test an intriguing scenario of climate in the past. Today, this semi-arid region is part of Colorado's Pueblo Reservoir State Park. But when dinosaurs ruled the earth, it was covered in water. Searching among the ancient rocks for evidence of the ancient sea is geologist Eric Barron. These rocks date from the Cretaceous period, about 90 million years ago. The characteristics of these rocks and the fossils we find in these rocks tell us that this area was covered by a broad, shallow sea. The sea stretched from Colorado to Kansas and from the Gulf of Mexico to the Arctic Basin. If we look at the fossils, we see that they're distinctly marine. They indicate that the climate was much warmer than it is today. If we go to a place like Greenland, we find fossil alligators. And unless an alligator had fur, the climates must have been much warmer than they are today. 
Fossils in the rocks tell of a place in sharp contrast with eastern Colorado's near desert environment today. A hundred million years ago, dinosaurs roamed here in what must have been a lush and tropical world. At the National Center for Atmospheric Research, Eric Barron uses a computer model to find out what might have caused such warmth in Earth's past. The position of the continents is adjusted to the time of the dinosaurs and other climate factors are added to create an ancient Earth. Barron knows what it was like then. He must find out why. The Cretaceous geography stored in this computer is clearly dramatically different than the present day geography. We see, for instance, Australia attached to Antarctica, India in the southern hemisphere, and the evidence for flooding, for instance, here in North America. His primary clue came from a new understanding of the planet's moving crust from plate tectonics. Scientists have discovered that the Earth's surface is cracked and broken. In the middle of the oceans is an undersea mountain range where a fiery drama begins the creation of Earth's crust. Hot rock from the interior rises and spreads the sea floor to each side. The result over time is the movement of Earth's continents across the globe. It's hard to imagine a more dramatic change in the surface of the Earth than what we see here. What is so incredible is that when we plug in this dramatic change in Cretaceous geography into a climate model, we achieve only one-third of the warming necessary to explain Cretaceous climates. What caused most of the warming? At the sites where seafloor is created, explorers in deep diving submersibles have found towering vents that spew gas and carbon dioxide into the ocean. Gases from the vents eventually escape to become part of the atmosphere. Elsewhere, seafloor is recycled back into the earth along the world's deep ocean trenches. As the seafloor sinks into the Earth's interior, it melts. Carbon, locked in the Earth's interior for millions of years, rises to the surface and explodes in volcanic violence, once again enriching the atmosphere. By increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in his model, Barron can now account for the extreme warmth of the Cretaceous period. If the model is accurate, the rocks of eastern Colorado should reveal widespread evidence of volcanic activity. Within these same Cretaceous rocks, we find the evidence for increased volcanism that would have led to increased carbon dioxide levels during the Cretaceous. Each one of these yellow layers represents the rain of ash from a volcanic eruption. As you can see, there are multiple layers. All around the globe, we find similar evidence for substantially increased volcanic activity during the Cretaceous. We discovered that the locations of continents and the flooding of the continents is only part of the story of explaining the Cretaceous warmth. A combination of all of the data and the results from climate models strongly suggest that a CO2 greenhouse effect may have played a major role in explaining the extreme warmth of the Cretaceous. This has probably happened repeatedly in the past. If it's happened in the past, it can happen again. Now, scientists have added a new chapter to the carbon dioxide story. Pat Zimmerman is an atmospheric chemist. He now studies termites. In the wild, their populations remain in check, but Zimmerman believes the accelerated clearing of rainforests and grasslands may lead to a population explosion that could well influence world climate. There already may be as many as three quarters of a ton of termites for every human being on Earth. We think that global termite populations could be increasing. An area of tropical forest roughly the size of Connecticut is cleared each year. And when it's cleared, the ecosystem is greatly simplified. The whole decomposer chain is removed, predators are removed. And that allows termite populations to really explode. 
Creatures of antiquity, termites have inhabited the earth for a hundred million years. Long studied for their complex social structure, Zimmerman is now monitoring termites for methane, one of a number of warming gases like carbon dioxide. Methane has doubled over the past 150 years, and scientists are concerned about its long-range impact. To measure the amount of methane a termite can produce, the insects are placed in a jar together with a piece of wood. Each jar is attached to an instrument that will analyze how much wood is converted to methane. The primary food of termites is cellulose, found in plants and trees. Few animals can digest it, but termites have evolved one of the most efficient symbiotic relationships in nature. Buried deep in their digestive system is a swarm of microbes that secretes an enzyme to reduce cellulose to sugar. The sugar is then absorbed by the termites. A byproduct of this chemical transformation is methane. Although this experiment seems pretty simple, nobody had ever done it before. Uh, people had realized that termites could emit methane as long as 50 years ago, but nobody had the capability to be able to quantitate the emission rate, and nobody realized that there were enough termites in the world so that that emission could potentially affect the chemistry of the Earth's atmosphere. The results of Zimmerman's research are intriguing, but evidence also suggests that methane is on the rise from other sources, like swamps and cattle and the increasing cultivation of rice, but methane is only one of the greenhouse gases that now may influence Earth's climate. If these gases continue to increase, they could double the warming effect of carbon dioxide early in the next century, faster and much more alarming than previously thought. Although this research is in its initial stages and it's still somewhat controversial, there's no question that our Earth and its climate would be completely different if it weren't for the activities of biological sources. Our Earth is a delicate balance between our atmosphere and our biosphere. The emissions from termites illustrate how a single organism has the potential to affect our climate. Sometime in the 1990s, climate scientists expect to have conclusive proof whether the current warming trend is larger than the normal fluctuations we observe in climate. Climatologist Steven Schneider. We in the climate sciences face a big challenge. When are we gonna have a global understanding of the climate system, how it will change, and how it will impact upon people and the rest of the planet Earth? The trouble is, we know that we have greenhouse gases increasing. We know that they can have a global effect. It's not new to think that there could be environmental problems. They go back decades. In fact, they go back centuries. The London smogs are a good example, but they were local. Acid rain is another well-known example, but it tends to be regional. What makes the greenhouse effect both unique, interesting, and admittedly disturbing is that it's both global and potentially long-lasting. We have our climate models. They give us a crystal ball, if you will, but they're not perfect. The crystal ball is dirty. And the tough question for us to ask is, how long do we clean the glass before we act on what we think we see inside? For the first time, man may play an ominous role in the future climate of planet Earth. Although climate changes seem inevitable, and the processes that determine it are still not understood, the human species is now a major player in the drama. Today, new tools and technology help scientists assemble the pieces of the climate puzzle. We have now begun to understand the factors that influence the climate of planet Earth. We have uncovered the record of a spectacular past, revealed in Earth's rock, its oceans, the ice and air, and even its life. We have seen devastating ice ages transform the Earth and tropical climates in places now frigid. We have journeyed into space and found clues to our future. Could Earth become a world of fire or a world of ice? A new frontier of exploration has uncovered an Earth that has changed in the past and will change in the future. How much and when 
are the questions that remain in the perplexing puzzle of the climate of planet Earth. For over a hundred million years, they ruled the earth, the largest creatures that ever lived. And then suddenly, mysteriously, they disappeared. A force even greater than the great dinosaurs may have wiped them out in a single stroke. Now, in one of the most intriguing stories in science, Researchers are finding clues that link the disappearance of these great beasts to events in space. The trail of discovery begins on a hillside behind an ancient Roman town and leads halfway around the world to the badlands of Montana. Armed with new tools and ideas, scientists are seeing the unseen. Electron microscopes have opened the door to the infinite world of the very small. Computers sift and organize the fossil record. And great telescopes probe the far reaches of our solar system as one scientist searches for what he calls Nemesis, the Death Star. It is a search that one day may reveal the future of planet Earth. On a battered moon lies the evidence of a force that shaped our planet. Beneath the hostile clouds of Venus may be the landscape of a primitive Earth. The red planet, Mars. Upon it lies the evidence of gigantic floods that once scoured its surface. Join us now on a voyage of discovery to the edge of the solar system and to strange new worlds that hold the secrets of our own creation. The story of planet Earth begins in space. Allen Hills of Antarctica, one of the most forbidding places on Earth. An unlikely setting in which to begin the exploration of our solar system, 
But in these bleak ice fields are clues to its earliest history. In bone-shattering cold and winds that reach 100 miles per hour, bands of scientists camp here each brief Antarctic summer. They come to scour the ice for meteorites, fragments of the solar system that have fallen to Earth. Meteorites are trapped in a huge conveyor belt of ice and carried from the heart of the continent toward the sea. As the Allen Hills block the flowing ice and allow wind to wear it away, meteorites migrate to the surface. These tiny lumps were created by the same tumultuous processes that created the sun and planets. They are cosmic time capsules. Preserved in this colossal freezer, they tell a tale as old as the Earth itself. By analyzing this ancient material, scientists can reconstruct the events that created our solar system. Some four and a half billion years ago, near the outer reaches of the Milky Way, a huge cloud of gas and dust begins to condense. Billions of miles across, the cloud collapses into a flat spinning disk, a solar nebula. Within the disk, particles collide and adhere, and the primordial sun and planets struggle to emerge. As the sun ignites, it blows away most of the gas from the inner solar system, and only hot, rocky worlds remain. Enormous collisions shaped the planet we will one day call Earth. Perhaps one last immense impact spins off matter that will become the moon. The Earth begins its slow transformation into the planet on which we live today. Four and a half billion years later, the Earth is still evolving. We inhabit a restless, shifting planet whose surface changes in endless cycles of creation and destruction. Most of the Earth's history is preserved in its rocks, but vast chapters are missing. The very earliest rocks from Earth's first billion years are gone, destroyed by its incessant activity. How can we know what happened on Earth before its restless geology erased the record? Our nearest neighbor in space was shaped by the same events that made the infant Earth. Might our long dead moon hold the secret of Earth's missing history? But if I were to say, my fellow citizens, that we shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away a giant rocket made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body, and do all this and do it right. July 20th, 1969. Apollo 11 relays live pictures from the moon. Craters glide by. Are they extinct volcanoes? Or wounds left by still more violent events in the distant past? Ironically, part of the answer lies in rare moon-like regions of the Earth itself. It is not easy to see craters on Earth. Most are so eroded that only faint circular scars remain. But how were these strange structures formed? The mystery was solved here at Meteor Crater near Flagstaff, Arizona. A mile across and 600 feet deep, this enormous hole was created 50,000 years ago in an event of unimaginable force. Many scientists believe that Meteor Crater was the remnant of an old volcano. The real explanation involves a more radical idea 
that bodies from space helped shape the Earth. Gene Shoemaker, a scientist with the U.S. Geological Survey, helped prove that the crater formed when a nickel-iron meteorite blazed through the skies and smashed into the Earth. The evidence was all around. Well, the main evidence for the impact origin of this crater is in the geology. Some of it's right here underneath our feet, where there's a deep lens, 600 feet deep, of broken rock that was explored near the turn of the century by Daniel Moreau Beringer and his associates. And what we find is a deep lens of broken rock going to that depth with the lower 50 feet containing the melted droplets of the meteorite, now frozen in shock-melted rock. Another part of the evidence we can see straight away in the crater walls up here. We can see the uh, rocks are actually offset along a large fault. One side of the crater wall has been peeled out much further than the other side. The rocks that were once here in the middle of the crater were thrown out in the shock wave and spewed out like the petals of a flower blossoming and just laid out on the surrounding terrain as a giant blanket of broken material. Collisions with Earth are extremely rare, so to study their role in the formation of planets, scientists invent ways to make their own. Planetary geologist Pete Schultz and his colleagues at the NASA Ames Research Facility near San Francisco perform unique experiments to demonstrate what happens when a body from outer space strikes the surface of a planet. With an instrument called a vertical gas gun, they reconstruct these great collisions. 400 frames per second up here. Right. And we've got an 8,500 frames per second nova on the side. A vacuum is produced to simulate conditions in space. Then explosions are recorded in extreme slow motion. 200 frames per second with the 2,000. Good. So we should be pretty well set. At 25,000 miles an hour, the gun fires metal pellets down a barrel more than three stories long. Okay, Earl, let's shoot it. Let's take a look and see what we've got. This sequence shows the crater as it grows. It grows in a very orderly process. It's not chaotic. And under a vacuum condition, there's nothing to interact. And we can see the ejecta curtain simply move out as a wall of debris. Very early times, this wall of debris actually has the ejecta moving upward and outward. At later times, that ejecta is moving downward and outward. But the net effect is still this, this wall of, a, of advancing material. You can see that the ejecta curtain moves or turns into clumps. And these clumps eventually will impact the surface as it moves outward in this very orderly process. In miniature, these experiments recreate the impact craters we see on the moon. Well, here's the crater. Now, this is the edge of the target. We find the crater right in the center, and we find a very nice symmetrical rim. As we go away from the crater, the ejecta, the material tossed out by the crater, thins with distance. If we step back, we find that we have clumps or rays of material. We saw that in the films. We saw the, the ejecta curtain breaking into the clumps and then impacting the surface. And this is what makes up the crater rays that we see on the moon. These experiments reveal the forces that left thousands of craters and their explosive rays on the moon. Yet to read its real history, we have to know when the bombardments took place. And the moon's dark plains and ragged mountains, when were they formed? Until men walked on the moon, no one knew. As astronauts roam the moon's surface, their most important task is to gather samples of rock. Look at the size of that rock! We can see. The closer I get to it, the bigger it is. Most scientists believe that the moon's rocks would be ancient. Dating the lunar surface would finally reveal the early history of both the moon and Earth. They were wrong. 
Most moon rocks were between three and four billion years old, much older than those on the geologically more active Earth. But still, some half a billion years of the moon's history was missing. The samples gathered so carefully were not part of the moon's original surface after all. It too had vanished like the Earth's in the remote past. As more samples were returned, the early chapters of the moon's history began to emerge. Four and a half billion years ago, the initial formation of the moon is complete. Its surface, heated by repeated impacts, cools. Four billion years ago, a second massive bombardment may have occurred, destroying much of the original surface rock. For millions of years, lava wells up through the crater floors, hiding still more of the original surface. Three billion years ago, the moon's surface solidifies. Except for a slow rain of impacts from space, it remains unchanged today. Our journey to the moon provided a surprise. Bombardments in space are not occasional catastrophes, but the most important force in the formation of planets. To Gene Shoemaker, Meteor Crater reminds us that impacts once helped shape the Earth as well. On the Earth today, other processes are more important, so that impact craters are a rather inconspicuous feature of our landscape. But on the Moon, on Mercury, on Mars, on some of the satellites of Jupiter and the satellites of Saturn, impact craters are still the dominant feature of the landscape and the dominant part of the geology. To explore these neighboring planets, we developed even more fabulous machines. Robots, sophisticated enough to travel millions of miles, were built. To scrutinize the worlds beyond, to land upon them, and to report upon what they found. The first planet we would visit was Venus. For millennia, man has seen Venus as a bright star glimmering on the horizon. Until recently, it resisted exploration. Scientists know Venus as our sister planet, nearly the same size and weight as Earth. Still, it remained a puzzle enshrouded in a mantle of clouds. Our voyages revealed it to be a most unearthlike place. If we could descend through the dense atmosphere of Venus, we would find it filled with carbon dioxide, racked by storms and bolts of lightning. Unlike the billowy white clouds of Earth, those on Venus are thick and poisonous, filled with sulfur and sulfur droplets, an acid rain capable of dissolving the hardest of metals. At some levels, winds up to 200 miles an hour whip the clouds around the planet. And on the surface, the immense atmosphere creates a pressure 90 times more crushing than on Earth. No place can replicate the climate of Venus. No other world is as scorched and barren. No other landscape so charred and seared. But Death Valley on a hot afternoon can give us an idea. Venus has evolved very differently from Earth. How did it become the hot, desolate planet it is today? Jim Head, a planetary scientist at Brown University, is an authority on Venus. Here in Death Valley, we find ourselves in one of the hottest places on the Earth. But it's nowhere near as hot as it is on the surface of Venus. Even though temperatures here in Death Valley on a really hot day can exceed 120 degrees Fahrenheit, on Venus, they get up regularly to 900 degrees Fahrenheit. In fact, it's hot enough on the surface of Venus to melt lead. How did it get this way? You might think it was because Venus, in fact, is closer to the sun than the Earth is, but it's only part of the answer. On Earth, the heat that comes into the surface can actually be re-radiated out to space again. On the other hand, on Venus, the very dense, thick atmosphere acts as an incredible greenhouse, a global greenhouse, which traps the heat underneath the surface of the cloud layer and builds up the heat over time. Only the Soviet Union has successfully landed probes on the surface of Venus. 
Before they were destroyed in the hostile atmosphere, they radioed back images of a strange and hellish world. The pictures are extraordinary, but they tell us little about the geography of Venus. In 1977, America's pioneer Venus spacecraft used radar to pierce the dense clouds, and Jim Head and his colleagues had a global view of the planet. Now, the Pioneer Venus spacecraft provided information from an orbiter, which, using radar instruments, was able to provide a global topographic map of the surface of Venus. We can color the blues, lowlands areas, as shown here. We can then color intermediate plains and greens, and highlands and yellows and browns and reds. When we look at this now, we can get a much better idea of the three-dimensional nature of the altitudes. And from this, we can begin to see areas such as lowland areas here, that are like ocean basins on the Earth in terms of the low area, but of course, because of the heat on Venus, don't have any water in them at the present time. We can also see some very distinctive highland regions. Ishtar Terra here is about the size of Australia and has some very distinctive linear mountain ranges. This one, Maxwell Montes, rises some 30,000 feet above the mean radius, which is higher than Mount Everest is on the Earth. But even these pictures are inadequate. Much of the Earth's geology would remain hidden if it were depicted in the same way. Now, this is really interesting because all the familiar features, North and South America and Australia and the ocean basins, really look dramatically familiar. But when we look in more detail, we realize we have the same problem. The resolution isn't good enough to understand the nature of the geology. Something as dramatic as the Grand Canyon is just simply not visible at this resolution. So one of the obvious things is that we can really get a picture of the geography of Venus using the Pioneer Venus information, but we really have no idea what the geological origin of the surface features are. To study the forces that shaped Venus, Jim Head and his colleagues use a very special tool. High in the Puerto Rican mountains near Arecibo rests the largest radio telescope on Earth. A thousand feet across, this giant radar antenna bounces signals off the distant surface of Venus and scoops up the faint echoes that return. The Arecibo data gives us 50 to 100 times better resolution than the Pioneer Venus information. And you can see what the effect of this is by looking at Beta Regio here and outlining on it a area that we will see using the higher resolution Arecibo data. Across 26 million miles of space, Arecibo senses details down to a single kilometer. At close range, Venus is still more astonishing. Now, instead of a series of really vivid colors, what we see here is a lot of detail, which is really exciting because we can see right in the middle of the valley a whole series of bright lines which probably represent faults and a large circular structure down here which has arms leading away from it. Now, let's look at these in even more detail, particularly the area to the north and we can see a lot of faults all the way through the middle of this extensive trough. This is very much like the setting in the East African Rift on Earth, where extensional forces are pulling the crust apart and faulting it into a deep valley. If we look to the south, we see that the circular feature is even more dramatic. It is a volcano which is built up on top of the faults, filling in the valley and sending lava flows extending away from the valley down the sides of the structure. So we can see here extensional tectonic forces, much like we see on the Earth, and volcanism associated with this extension, much like Mount Kilimanjaro is associated with the East African Rift on the Earth. For billions of years, Earth has been changing. The process called plate tectonics is restlessly rearranging its surface, shifting its crust around the planet. How did the process begin? Curiously, Venus may hold the answer. Looking at Venus may be a way of looking back across time at the Earth before the beginning of plate tectonics. Samples collected there may tell us even more. In a five billion year old Venus, we may be looking at a two billion year old Earth, an Earth as it was in its youth. Beyond Venus lies the red planet, Mars. Just one third the size of Earth, the atmosphere of Mars is so thin it is barely there at all. 
The Mariner and Viking spacecraft revealed a world upon whose surface was written a violent and restless past. Across the Martian equator, they found an enormous gash, the Valles Marineris. Two miles deep, it stretches the length of the United States and could swallow scores of Grand Canyons. Nothing quite like it had been seen anywhere in the solar system. Only in our imagination can we sweep through these great canyons, but future spacecraft almost certainly will. To the northwest of the Valles Marineris, Mariner 9 photographed an immense volcano rising three times the height of Mount Everest. 17 miles from surface to summit, it has a base as broad as the state of Montana, a place so majestic it is named Mount Olympus. Clearly, Mars is a world that works on a gigantic scale. We Earthlings have always found Mars intriguing, even before we sent probes to investigate. A century ago, we could only view it from observatories like this in the hills of Flagstaff, Arizona. But we speculated it might not be a planet too different from our own. We nurture the ultimate hope that Mars, too, harbored intelligent life. Toby Owen is a scientist who studies the atmosphere of Mars. Of all of the other planets, Mars is the one most often imagined to be capable of supporting some form of life. This is a book of drawings of Mars made by Percival Lowell, who built this entire observatory about a hundred years ago so that he could study this planet in great detail. Lowell described a world that fired the public imagination. Through his telescope, he made amazing observations. Each year, he watched the planet's ice caps wax and wane. During the Martian summer, he observed dark areas spread across the face of the red planet. These, he proclaimed, were the blossomings of Martian forests. Carefully, he recorded these changes in his notebooks. Vegetation was not the only kind of life Lowell saw on Mars. He believed it was the home of a desperate and dying race, one that had built a vast network of canals to carry water from its polar ice caps to the parched cities at its equator. As proof, he mapped an intricate system of Martian aqueducts and predicted that one day we would find the inhabitants of an ancient civilization. That is not how things turned out. This is the telescope that Percival Lowell used to make his observations of Mars, the one through which he looked to make the drawings. Lowell was trapped on the Earth, as all astronomers were, until we learned how to send spacecraft to the other planets. When we finally got to Mars with the Viking project, we found a planet very different from the one that Lowell had imagined. No evidence of canals, no canal builders, no evidence of life of any kind. To get a feeling for what Mars is like today, you might think of yourself being there on a camping expedition, and your job is to try to make a fire and boil an egg. The first thing you'd discover is that there's no fuel on Mars. There's nothing on the surface of the planet that will burn, not only no life, no organic material. The second thing you'd discover is that even if there were fuel, it wouldn't burn, because there's only a tiny trace of oxygen in the Martian atmosphere. So that's Mars as we find it now a dry, cold, desert-like planet with no possibility for life as we know it to exist there. From the pictures the Viking landers returned, it is not difficult to understand why we found nothing living on Mars. But photographs taken high above the planet reveal a different world. Locked in the ice caps of Mars are oceans of water. And once that water flowed across the Martian surface, Remnants of ancient riverbeds clearly reach out in fine finger-like patterns. And great scoured regions that resemble floodplains speak of a time when Mars was not always so desolate and cold. What could have created these strange features? The first clue came from Earth. The Scablands of central Washington state 13,000 years ago, a 3,000-square-mile lake covered much of Montana, 
until it burst its glacial dam and roared across the scablands. A wall of water 30 stories high exploded toward the Pacific to devastate everything in its path. In its wake, it left one of the strangest geological formations on Earth. Like great scars upon the skin of planet Earth, the scablands remain, proof of the power unleashed by a catastrophic flood. Normally, these canyons and buttes would take millions of years to form. The flood gouged them out in less than a single week. From high above, the scars left by the great flood on Earth are astonishingly similar to the bizarre terrain of Mars. Billions of years ago, in flash floods that dwarf those on Earth, liquid water must have rushed over the surface of Mars. Perhaps in the distant past, it was a planet much more like our own. If water was present on Mars, it may have harbored life. Toby Owen believes that once Mars had a much warmer climate and held liquid water. It would have had a much thicker atmosphere, a blanket of gases to trap heat, just as the atmosphere of Earth does today. That atmosphere would have been rich in carbon dioxide, which is a very good gas for holding heat in once a planet gets warmed up. It would have exerted enough pressure, just about twice as much as we're experiencing right now, to allow liquid water to exist on the surface. So you have a warm temperature, a high pressure, liquid water, and of course the gases in the atmosphere provide you with the elements that you need to get life started. We have all the basic conditions that life would need to begin on Mars. The only question is, did it happen and what did it produce? In Shark Bay in Western Australia, there are clues to what life on Mars may have been like. Here, organisms similar to those that flourished everywhere on Earth three billion years ago still live. They are stromatolites, rocky domes built by microbial communities. For more than a billion years, they were the dominant form of life on our planet. If Martians ever existed, they very possibly looked like this. But Mars lost its atmosphere and its water. The planet froze and the thread of life would have been broken. Percival Lowell's desperate race of canal builders never did rule Mars, but if ever there was life on the planet, it was no less doomed. Mars is the last of the rocky, Earth-like planets. Far beyond it is an entirely different kind of solar system. In 1977, the Voyager spacecraft set out on a grand tour of these strange, faraway worlds. 400 million miles from home, the first stop is Jupiter, a huge, vaporous planet of gas. A remarkable infrared picture reveals Jupiter as never before. With no solid surface, it continually radiates heat from its core. Had it been several times larger, it would have ignited to become a second sun. 300 times more massive than the Earth, Jupiter spins almost three times as fast. Images radioed back by Voyager are computer enhanced to reveal curious patterns that cover Jupiter's surface. The Jovian atmosphere is filled with clouds that twist and turn in a thousand shapes. Huge anticyclones disrupt the planet. The largest is the great red spot, big enough to swallow three Earths. Sped up, the tireless activity of Jupiter's turbulent atmosphere comes to life. Countless storms are driven by heat from deep within the planet. Around Jupiter orbits a bizarre system of moons. Each holds surprises for the scientists who first see them. Callisto is scarred by giant impacts that have left concentric patterns of rings across its icy surface. Ganymede is the largest of Jupiter's moons. 
Unlike our own moon, much of its mass consists of water ice. Europa is the brightest of the moons. Its brilliant cracked surface is covered with a smooth layer of ice. As Voyager photographs Io, one of the strangest stories of the mission begins to unfold. What caused the markings on this oddly mottled world? At the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, Torrance Johnson is a member of the Voyager's imaging team. As, as we got closer and closer to Jupiter, uh, Io began to look stranger and stranger to us. The uh, picture you see on the screen here is, is more or less typical of what we saw in the last couple of weeks before encounter. We thought we'd start seeing very large impact basins, craters such as we've seen on the, the Moon, Mercury, and Mars. We could see strange markings, but no signs of craters. We couldn't, when we were actually looking at these pictures in real time, fully interpret what we were seeing. But what we did know was that uh, we were looking at a geologically very young surface, and that the surface must be renewing or resurfacing itself uh, in some manner. This image, made for spacecraft navigation, supplies the first tantalizing clue. When it is enlarged and enhanced, a faint smudge appears over Io's limb. Voyager has captured a volcano in action, the first ever seen outside the Earth. Voyager uncovers how the eruptions are produced. Io's volcanoes consist of hot sulfur compounds that explode at hundreds of miles an hour. Towering plumes rise 200 miles above its surface. As it flies by, Voyager captures eight more active volcanoes. Seen in these remarkable pictures from space, Io is riddled with clear evidence of multiple eruptions. Huge volcanic craters dot its surface. The giant lakes of molten sulfur present a look of decay and disease. Io is a tortured world. Caught between the gravitational fields of Jupiter and Europa, it is constantly stretched and squeezed. As heat from inside escapes, the moon literally turns itself inside out. Half a billion miles beyond Jupiter, Voyager encounters Saturn, another astonishing world. Saturn's greatest glory is its intricate system of rings. More than 100,000 miles wide, they may be less than 100 yards thick. The three main rings seen from Earth prove to include a dazzling array of ringlets within the rings. One day they may help us better understand those forces that shape the disk from which the solar system itself was formed. Beyond Saturn are still other worlds. I see Uranus with its peculiar upright rings. And Neptune with its moon Triton, colder, more mysterious, and more distant still. Eventually, Voyager leaves all the planets behind. Beyond the last outpost of our solar system is the Oort cloud, a shell of cosmic debris that remained after the planets were formed the Oort cloud, where comets reside. Unexpectedly, the debris from this faraway place may have profound effects upon planet Earth. From afar, Earth seems not so different from the worlds around it. Yet our journeys to other worlds have shown us that of all the planets in the solar system, planet Earth is unique. Blessed by its distance from the sun, our planet has become a great blue oasis in the solar system. Like no other world, it is awash with oceans of liquid water. Its air is rich with oxygen. And for billions of years, its temperatures have remained constant. 
It is a stage upon which geology and chemistry have worked amazing miracles. Three and a half billion years ago, the Earth produced life. From the humblest beginnings, life has grown, spread, and evolved. Tenaciously, it has filled every nook and cranny on the planet. Yet the bewildering variety of life has undergone immense change. Species that now roam the Earth have not always been here. Evolution favors the fittest. Thousands and thousands of families of animals have come and thrived and then disappeared. But even here, events in space may play a part. This quarry in Utah contains an entire hillside filled with the remains of huge creatures that once lived and breathed and now are gone. Dinosaurs once lived here, the largest and most spectacular animals ever to walk the planet. For a hundred million years, they dominated the Earth. Then, 65 million years ago, the last of the dinosaurs vanished. Only their bones remain. The disappearance of the dinosaurs and the creatures that lived with them is one of the great mysteries of science. Now a new theory links the death of the giant beasts with events in outer space. The story begins half a world away. In central Italy lies the little medieval town of Gubbio, an unlikely setting for one of the most exciting scientific detective stories of modern times. Gubbio is not so very different from any other tiny hill town. The faces that gaze upon its ancient streets today mirror those that gazed here generations ago. To its people, Gubbio is still a good place to work and to play. Yet clues found here may lead to a scientific breakthrough. Containing elements of chance and of brilliant insight, much of the story is still fiercely debated as scientists weigh the evidence and test alternate ideas. The clues come from a nearby gorge containing limestone rock laid down during the Cretaceous era, when dinosaurs lived on Earth. In 1975, Walter Alvarez, a geologist from Berkeley, notices a thin layer of dark clay embedded in the rock just at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, that time when the last dinosaurs disappeared. The mystery begins to unravel when Walter shows the clay to his father, Nobel Prize-winning physicist Louis Alvarez. Well, this is the clay layer that uh, we found. And at first glance, it looks like a fairly ordinary little half inch of clay. But it turns out to be quite remarkable because it falls between the highest bed of the Cretaceous, which is the time during which the dinosaurs were living, and the first bed of the tertiary, which was deposited after the dinosaurs were gone. And this represents a very small period of time. We now think that this clay layer represents only about a year, but what got the whole project started was the question of how long it took to deposit that clay layer. I had an idea which turned out later to have been an old idea, and that was the fact that uh, when meteorites come into the atmosphere, most of them burn up. They're shooting stars. When they burn up, they turn into meteoric dust, and the dust settles down on the surface of the Earth. So it's just as though you went around uh, with a salt shaker and shook meteoric dust all over the earth at a certain constant rate. And so the basic idea was that you could tell how fast the rocks were laid down or how fast the clay layer was laid down by observing how much of this special kind of salt, if you want. Salt was sprinkled all over the earth by the meteoric dust coming down. Measuring how much dust the clay contains would reveal how long the clay had taken to form. But when the clay at Gubbio is tested for iridium, a rare metal found in the cosmic dust, the results startle everyone. It contains far more than a steady rain of dust from space can explain. So eventually we came to the 
firm conclusion that it was an impact from a big chunk of solar system material, either an asteroid or a comet. And that threw up a big cloud of dust, blacked out the light, made it very cold, probably. We weren't sure of that, but a whole lot of terrible things would happen if all that dust came down through the atmosphere. If Louis Alvarez is right, the dinosaurs met their end in a cosmic collision. Dust thrown high above the atmosphere rapidly circled the Earth. Sunlight was blocked, and day was turned to perpetual night. In the cold and the dark, the dinosaurs and three quarters of all living species became extinct. As the dust slowly cleared, it formed the clay layer and revealed the desolate face of a devastated Earth. It's an elegant idea, but is it true? The same clay layer has now been found in dozens of sites, but might it have come from volcanic activity here on Earth? Bruce Bohor, a geologist with the U.S. Geological Survey and an authority on volcanic clays, decides to investigate for himself. Bohor knows these rocks at Brownie Butte, Montana, contain pollen and spores from plants that lived with the last of the dinosaurs. Using them as a guide, he quickly unearths the Cretaceous Tertiary boundary, the time when the dinosaurs disappeared. The lowest rock that we've exposed here is a dark carbonaceous shale, which is the last of the Cretaceous sediments. We know that from the pollen and spores. And on top of that is this pink layer, which is the fallout layer. Over that is a thin coal streak. Uh, we know that the plants change drastically across this boundary here marked by the clay. Uh, when we found this clay and dug it out, it looked quite a bit different than the ordinary volcanic ashes that we've been finding. It was harder, it was pinker, it was much finer grained. And these reasons, plus the location at the approximate Cretaceous tertiary boundary, led us to believe that it was something special. Under an electron microscope, Bohor examines fragments of the clay. Treating them with acid, he notices that particles of quartz remain. The particles contain the clue he is searching for. Well, this is a normal appearing quartz grain, one that you might see from any sedimentary rock or uh, igneous rock or volcanic. It shows no particular features on the surface. It's fairly smooth. But let's look around in the sample and see what else we can find. Now here we have a quartz grain that shows some unusual features. These grooves were apparently formed by the hydrofluoric acid that we used in etching the grains. We had never seen anything like these features on these quartz grains throughout examination of thousands of rocks of various types. We went to the literature and found out that other people had seen something like this, but only at the sites of known impacts of meteorites upon the Earth or at the sites of nuclear explosions. So the quartz in the clay was formed by an impact, too. It convinces Bohor that 65 million years ago, an enormous impact shook the Earth. But have these visitors from space devastated the Earth more than once? The story moves on. At the University of Chicago, Jack Sepkowski has found another twist to this intriguing tale. He is compiling a list of the animals that became extinct in the past 250 million years. Carefully, he notes the time when each creature lived and when it died. With over 3,500 families on file, it is the most complete record that exists. Intrigued by the cosmic impact idea, Sepkowski begins his analysis. The results are unexpected. The peaks on the graph reveal a whole series of mass extinctions, some large, some small. More remarkably, they are not random extinctions. They seem to occur in regular cycles every 26 million years. The pattern of extinctions is a complete surprise to Sepkowski and to his colleague, David Raup. What we saw was that these didn't appear to be randomly arrayed in time. 
but rather happening, rather regularly. We, we said it can't be regular. This must be some sort of statistical fluke. How do we go about testing that? Each one of these events is not a, an entity unto itself, but part of a regular pattern. So if we're going to understand extinction, we've got to understand each and every one of these extinctions, and not just one. The second implication is the implication that we can't consider the biosphere as a closed system that uh, ha has a history independent of not just the Earth, but the Earth's extraplanetary environment. That if we want to understand the history of life, we have to understand the history of the solar system as well. Do we live on a planet that is devastated every 26 million years? Many scientists doubt that such cyclic extinctions really occur. Back in Berkeley, Louis Alvarez, like many scientists, is skeptical about these results until he mentions them to Rich Muller, a young colleague. Muller begins to think, how to explain the regularity. If the sun had a companion star, and it were in an orbit that were far enough and fat enough that it would be a stable orbit, it would still affect those comets. Each time Muller suggests a solution, Louis Alvarez promptly knocks it down. Finally, an ingenious theory emerges, one that Alvarez agrees is worth testing. Muller proposes that the sun has a small dark companion star, which he names Nemesis. Every 26 million years, Nemesis comes close enough to disrupt the Oort cloud, that distant shell of comets at the edge of the solar system. On the computer screen here, I have a simulation of the solar system. The uh, dark circle there with the bright center represents the sun. Those small black dots that are orbiting around it like a swarm of bees represent just a few of the, of the many, many comets that are orbiting the sun. Off there in the distance is that large black dot that represents Nemesis. You'll notice it travels very slowly when it's far from the sun. It has very little effect on the comets then. But every 26 million years, or on this screen every few seconds, it sweeps around close to the sun, comes in very close to the comets, it disturbs their orbits and sends a large number of them showering in towards the Earth and the sun. Rich Muller's bold ideas are not as bizarre as they appear. The sun might have a companion, since most of the stars we can see are part of multiple star systems. If Nemesis does exist, it should give us little to fear. It will not be back for 15 million years. Meanwhile, the search for Nemesis is underway at the Leuchner Observatory near Berkeley. While most scientists remain skeptical that the sun's companion is actually there, Rich Muller and his colleagues are conducting an ambitious survey of the skies. We're using this telescope in our search for Nemesis. The idea is to take a photograph of a star and then come back and look at it again six months later. Uh, if it's a nearby star, then the Earth will have moved around the sun and the star will look like it's at a slightly different angle than it had been six months earlier. We have 5,000 candidate stars, 5,000 stars that have been catalogued, that have been photographed. Any one of those could be Nemesis. For Richard Muller, this quest provides not merely an unlikely link between the death of the dinosaurs and a dark star. It may illuminate our own human origins, too. The mammals were around for a long time, but they were never able to take the Earth away from the dinosaurs until the dinosaurs were wiped out. Uh, the whole picture that we have of where we came from and where we're going uh, is, is affected by this. It, I, I find it exciting because it's not just physics, it's not just astrophysics. It's biology, it's evolution, it's paleontology. Um, it's a question of why are we here? The search for Nemesis may be in vain. Scientific attempts to understand the world around us often are. As other researchers develop competing ideas, Science moves on. The real meaning of the clay layer, the regularity of the extinctions, and the existences are all hotly debated. From which conflict, the truths will emerge.
The connection that don't exist may be greater than we thought. As messengers of action may too have been of life. In the birth of the solar system, countless planets fell to earth, became part of air, our water, and even the chemicals from which to evolve. The world is made of dust, and so is the grave of life that flourished. Evolved from the raw material once born from we now return to visit. In far away and froses on Earth, we are finding the evidence of action to the ghosts. The remains tell us that forces from home are the very same forces that once shaped, indeed have altered the course of evolution. We have visited other worlds and have discovered wonders about our own, and our brought us full circle. We have come home from our longest journey, a fresh sense of wonder, or a planet Earth.